Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we woke up this morning, and the world had changed. They might be rebooting the X-Men films. Also, your host of Collider Heroes, John Schnapp. That's right. He, you thought he was going to say something different, right? <laughs> <laughs> Also, your <laughs> host of Jedi Council, Christian Harlov. Hey, everybody. Good day. Also I like here, coffee. Jeremy Johns. I'm sticking right to the movies, folks. And you know it's Hollywood Prime when they run out of franchise and just reboot the hell out of it. Let's get on it. Let's. You, hey, but just so you know, guys, you know, a big event in the, in the United States yesterday, of course, the big election. So not a ton of movie news has dropped. So we plan on making this show all about you guys who watch us live. We're going to spend most of today's show just taking your live Twitter questions. So you can actually start firing in your Twitter questions now. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Start firing in those questions. We'll pick out a bunch to get to. But as I said off the top, there was one pretty significant thing that dropped this morning. Ashley, tell us about it. According to a report from THR, 20th Century Fox is moving full steam ahead on the Deadpool sequel while also developing a third Deadpool film. Not only that, the third installment will reportedly feature X-Force, the team of superheroes most famously led by Deadpool's frenemy Cable. Sources for THR also report that Simon Kinberg will oversee a new reboot of their flagship X-Men series, writing a new script that will keep Jennifer Lawrence, Michael Fassbender, and James McAvoy optimistically in mind to continue their roles. The spin-offs of Gambit and New Mutants will also be put back into active development, with The Fault in Our Stars director Josh Boone mentioned as possibly helming New Mutants, with cameras possibly beginning rolling in spring. John, thoughts on the new development slate of X-Men films at Fox? Well, there are two really big things within this story that stand out. Number one, we'll just touch on this one, is the Deadpool 3. They are so confident. Fox is so confident in this Deadpool franchise that they're looking already past Deadpool 2. They're looking at Deadpool 3. They've got a plan. And I do like this idea of instead of launching, you know, X-Force with an X-Force movie, launch them with a Deadpool movie. That seems to be the smart play. You introduce Cable and Domino in the second film. Then you expand that in the th third. You get them popular with the fans. Then you spin them out into their own series. It's a good long-term plan. I like the way they're, that they're approaching this. But the other thing is this, is this whole idea of them, maybe it's time to reboot the X-Men. Now, I know they say in the article, they're optimistically thinking of McAvoy and Fassbender and Jennifer Lawrence. I don't think that's gonna happen. Look, all three of them, their contracts are now expired. They're done. They've already, they have so many continuity issues with this franchise. Remember, this is a franchise that has been running for 16 years. This franchise has been going. We've got Hugh Jackman Calling it quits, he's hanging up the claws after Logan, which looks amazing, by the way. I don't want, look, I'm a huge Jennifer Lawrence fan. Everybody knows that. I am a massive Jennifer Lawrence fan. I do not want her anywhere near an X-Men film anymore. Like, she has phoned it in far too much on this. She doesn't want to be there. It's time to reboot this thing and reboot it fresh. And, you know, we actually pre-recorded Heroes a little bit earlier this morning. And one of the things you'll hear me say there, it's like, forget this optimistic stuff. Either reboot it or don't reboot it. I'm totally fine with either. Don't reboot and try to continue on this mess of a continuity that you got now and make some fun films. I'm all for it. Or reboot it entirely. Don't do this quasi reboot, but we'll no. still have McAvoy that. No, no, no. You know what? You started off this franchise with Patrick Stewart and Hugh Jackman. You end this franchise with Patrick Stewart and Hugh Jackman and Logan, and it's time to start fresh. You did a great job for 15, 16 years. Put this in perspective, the MCU, which feels like it's been running forever, right. is only about halfway there right. for, compared to what the X-Men universe has done as far as longevity goes. So I really do hope, I think it is the good time. This is the right time, end this franchise with Logan. But Schnepp, you heard about this this morning too when we were doing Heroes earlier. What are your thoughts on, well, first of all, the Deadpool 3 notion with X-Force, and is it time to reboot X-Men? Well, I love the idea of doing uh, Deadpool 3. I don't know if they'll shoot them back to back with Deadpool 2, but at least it's a great, you know, it's saying, look, we're gonna introduce X-Force, 
the right way. We're going to give all those characters the time. And I think having X-Men reboot and having Deadpool going on in the same continuity will totally work because they didn't use any of the X-Men in Deadpool that, that we've seen before. They used Negasonic Teenage Warhead and a new Colossus that didn't that wasn't part of the X-Men continuity. So they could, in fact, continue forward with that X-Men. And I think doing the New Mutants before they relaunch the all new, all different X-Men, which is my title that I'd like to see happen, because that's a great way to say to everyone, not only is that the actual comic book title, but that's a way to show the audience, this is the all new, all different X-Men. We're rocking with Deadpool and X-Force, and here's the new X-Men, and just reboot the entire cast. I think that's a smart way to do it. You're right, the book is closed. 2000 to 2016. I joked about that's a great box set. You got all the Blu-rays. <laughs> there you go. It's the singer verse. There it is. It's ready for you. Here's some new flavor. That's what I, I'd like to see. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, I, well, starting with Deadpool 3, it's a smart move. You know Deadpool 2 is going to crush. Deadpool 1 is one of the, I think, Fox's most successful superhero film of all time. So that happening, going from two to three, makes a lot of sense. But then carrying on X Force, I agree with you completely. You're gonna—that's the way you always should do this: is get the characters popular first inside your sequel, the Cable, and then as you as you see that, then spawning them into the, their movie because it's continuing into this timeline. It's continuing into the shared universe in the Deadpool world alone. Now, as far as X Men goes, it's I'm, I'm mostly on your guy's side, as where I think for exactly what you were saying. I was when they're talking about. X Men. Obviously, I think you got to keep um, Colossus the same. Yeah. I think you keep Colossus the same, and you could put a new Professor X. You could put a, a new Wolverine. You can do all that stuff because it's mentioned in the Deadpool world. Ultimately, Deadpool is the one that spawns the brand new X Men universe to tie it all in to one thing. These brand new characters, the reboot well, that and we one get. One of the brilliant things about the way Deadpool was done is that you can now reboot this X Men franchise and have Deadpool as a part of it. That's what because, I mean, yeah. Yeah, because this was a very different Colossus. Negasonic Teenage Warhead was not a part of the other X-Men you, And you're introducing, part of yeah, and you're essentially, you, you already introduced the X-Men as a whole inside of, of right. Deadpool. So yes. the thing that I, it's, it's not a big thing, but I think we looked after Apocalypse, which I think we all, for the most part, I think I liked it the most at everybody at the table, I think. Um, but I think Brian Singer, has one more story to tell in the X-Men universe. Now, whether that's the 90s, I mean, there's still unanswered questions as far as what happened to Havoc. There are certain things going on inside of that world I still wanted to see tied up a little bit more And because Days of Future Past was great. Apocalypse was okay, was, was good for me, but I would have liked to see a great one end that one. I know Logan could be the one, like you're saying, mm -hmm. but I don't think we're gonna see any of those other characters. So I think a reboot could be good. Casting is crucial. Now I've heard from a couple of sources now, I'm gonna be very careful I say this. I've heard from several places now that Brian Singer is done. With, with the X Men universe, yeah. so I mean that that I think he made three amazing X Men films yeah. and one okay X Men film. Anyway, Jeremy, you hear about all of this. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> uh, my thoughts are Brian Singer will never get to do that Phoenix saga that he planned right. to do 16 mm. years ago, and I don't think we're ever going to see that Phoenix saga that we wanted to see. Um, but yeah, I think a, a reboot. If you're going to do a reboot, don't do the soft reboot. If you do the soft reboot with the same cast, you're doing exactly what they did in uh, X Men First Class just a few short years ago, and then successful franchise. Later, you're doing it again doesn't really make sense with Deadpool you have the opportunity for them to build their own Fox Marvel cinematic universe mm -hmm. in which you might be able to Fantastic Four is Fox also right uh, what is it? yes yeah so yes. you can have them as support you can you might be able to see a new cast on them and have them come in as support which do for them what they what Marvel did with the Incredible Hulk and, and kind of give them their place not their own solo movie um, it, it, it sounds like it sounds like a good idea per what the Deadpool and X-Men vision is. Um, I would have liked to have seen the con uh, the current string go into the Phoenix saga. But right now, as it is, like you said, continuity issues. Like, I'm not looking forward to trying to explain to my niece how the X-Men movies line up and how you should watch <laughs> them. It's like, I just, just pick one and you watch it and you just go from there. I have no idea how they line up at this point. So hopefully we'll get that if they do a reboot. But... For me, personally, nothing's going to beat Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, but I said the same thing about Jack Nicholson's Joker, so who knows? All right, so I said we would spend the majority of the show taking your Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, start sending in those questions. Follow us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Fire them in. We got Ashley and Wendy picking out questions, so what do we have up first? Who do you want 
to go for it, girl. All right. This one comes <laughs> from Goose Clues, who writes, what are your thoughts on Tom Holland's sixth film contract for Spider-Man? Yeah, a, a story just came out this morning. Actually, I believe, uh, I can't remember who broke the story, but a story came out this morning that Tom Holland has revealed that he has signed a six film deal. That's what he has. Apparently, there's also some discussion from, I keep forgetting how to pronounce her name, Zendaya? That they are talking about her character. Here's something interesting. She is still not confirmed that she is Mary Jane, from what I understand. And she says she is not a Peter Parker love interest, hmm. I, which is interesting. Now, I have to read the article more in depth to, to kind hmm. of figure out what it is they're talking. The highlight here, though, is that Holland is saying he has signed a six film deal. But like we always have to say whenever we hear about these eight film deals, four film deals, it actually means nothing. Remember this. Now, when a studio signs an actor to a six film deal, seven film deal, eight film deal, all that means now is that if the studio continues to call on that actor to come back to play that role, the actor is obligated to come back and play that role. What it does not mean is that the studio is obligated to continue using that actor however long they want. Who's the guy from Empire and he played Rhodey in the first Iron Man? Terrence again? Howard. Terrence Howard, yeah. Terrence Howard had a four film deal. Had a four film deal. That just means that he would have been obligated to come back and continue to play Rhodey had Marvel continued to ask him to come back, but they didn't. Well, he wanted too much money also. Well, there was yeah. that. There's yeah. a whole bunch of other things. The bottom line, though, is that these types of contracts do not obligate the studio. So the studio's under no obligation to make six Spider-Man movies. Mm -hmm. All it means is that Holland is obligated to come back and play Spider-Man that many times if they call him. But still... Everybody loved this kid in Civil War. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be great in this Spider-Man movie. Locking him down for that period of time, I think, is a great move. So I like it. Jeremy, you heard about this. What do you think? Yeah, but the more Tom Holland, the better. And whether or not it's going to go for six films, don't know, like you said. But, uh, I mean, the more we can get, the better. And the great news is <clears throat> it, it does show why they cast a young Peter Parker, which they should always cast a young Peter Parker, because Peter Parker being a teenager is part of Peter Parker. But his growth into adulthood is also a very important part of Spider-Man. So the fact that we get to see that, and then when he becomes an adult, adult problems, adult things, you know, a marriage to Mary Jane, and then, you know, who knows Would where they're going to... you say gonna... 99 problems? Uh, but Mary Jane ain't one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, Gwen Stacy, on the other hand, that was a big one. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. I love that, that, that kid. From the one scene, I've never had one scene with a character introduce someone that I so loved as much as that one thing. That was great. What do you think, Christian? Well, I mean, that's the point, is the fact that this we haven't got a Spider-Man to where we knew him in the comics as this young kid. Yeah. Now, Tobey Maguire, they had him in high school, but I mean, he, he was like 45 years old. <laughs> um, but he was still, I mean, I love Tobey Maguire in those first two movies. Mm -hmm. I think he was, and same thing with Andrew Garfield. But this was the young Spider-Man that we wanted, that we got, and you're right, you're gonna see him grow, and by, by locking him down to six pictures, it means that they had this, this plan. And now, also because it's associated with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it also means, should we, if they wanna use him in this particular movie or this, I'm sure it's part of the deal that they made with Marvel oh, one way or another. Yeah. So that, to me, makes a lot of sense, and you're right that this doesn't mean that Spider-Man's gonna be in six movies right now, that there's a plan for him to be in one, but the option is there. Now that they have him, it's why wouldn't you? Because he was one of the biggest standouts in that film. They're like, how is Spider-Man going to, oh my God, another Spider-Man, how's this going to work? And everybody loved him. Now, does he, that count for, is his appearance in Civil War one of the six films? So now we only have him for five movies. That's a good question. I don't yeah. know and if it's Spider-Man like, Homecoming I, is right. one of them. So now we only right. have him for four mm -hmm. more movies. If he's going to be in Avengers... Uh, Infinity War, that's the third film. So we have a Spider-Man well, trilogy so, now. Yeah, yeah. So, we, yeah, so maybe that's why they did it. Because the, qu the question is, when did this five-picture mm -hmm. deal get signed? Was it yesterday? Then that would probably be five more films. Right. Unless it was before, the, when he initially signed on, it was for all five. Because we always hear about, like, if Chris Evans had, like, I had a six-picture deal, but right. that one of those was used in the Thor cameo where it was Captain America that for, like, three seconds. Right. Oh, that's one of them. I, I don't know if, if cameos count. I honestly, I honestly I don't know. Not, because that would have been really foolish by the studio to use up what you could use the actor for an entire motion picture to use in a two-minute shot. I'm sure they probably made a little side deal. I right. hey, certainly hire so. you. Yeah, I'm that's probably saying, the know, case. Right. But this, therein lies the genius of hiring Tom Holland. Tom Holland is only 20 years old. Right. He's 20. That means he can play Spider-Man for the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it won't ever, and then he'll be as old as Tobey Maguire was when yeah, he started right. the yes. Spider-Man. So I mean, so you've got, that's why they went young, because now we can get this guy and he can play this character as long as we run it. So, I mean, this sounds good to me. I was kind of hoping, I'll be honest, 
to hear that they signed him to an eight film deal or a nine film deal, but maybe his management wouldn't let him go. <laughs> right. Or that those, long. like you're saying, those other, those little cameos don't count as yeah. like six well, feature film It's deals. basically the studio protects himself with, by signing on a 20 year old kid. He goes, all right, we have him for six films until we have to renegotiate because we might want right. him for 10 or 15. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. But by the time we get to, to film number seven, he's going to ask a lot. Look at what with Robert Downey Jr. Robert yes. Downey Jr. had a certain amount, and then he had to they had to really pay up, okay. and that's what's going to happen. Because if Spider Man delivers in the way we know Spider Man can, you get to that when it starts going into that seventh, eighth, ninth. This kid's going to be uh, happy he signed this deal. They in the should place. they should actually start calling these multi film deal multi film deals for comic book characters. They might as well call it the Robert Downey Jr. rule yeah. mm -hmm. because that's what initiated. That's what yeah. that's what you know. Marvel's like. We signed him for one or two films, and it really bit us in the ass. It cost us a lot to then re-sign. So now when they get these actors come in, okay, you want to star in our you know, Black Bolt movie? Great. Right. Sign a 12-film film. Nine deal. films, yeah. Right. Like, yeah, that's, something like that. That's, sorry, that's also why they couldn't, I, I still think, why they didn't lock down a Joaquin Phoenix, and some people might be happy with that now after seeing Doctor Strange, but initially that was the report that they couldn't get him to lock down for For, for, for multiple long. films, yeah. and that's them, like you said, they're protecting their own yeah. investments. All right, what do we got next? Last shot at Redemption writes, if there was an up-and-coming actor you could cast as a new Wolverine, who would you pick? Oh, man. Doug Ray Scott, give the guy his shot <laughs> that he didn't have back in 2000. Mission Impossible 2 <laughs> ruined his career. Oh, man. Um, you know who I wouldn't mind giving a shot to? Because I've always kind of hesitated. The fans have called for this guy a lot. They called for him to be Batman. I'm blanking on his name, but he was just in Doctor Strange. He was the one that has the astral projection fight with Doctor Strange. They talked with him as Batman. He's normally a stunt guy. Oh, okay. um, uh, Mark Riley, can you look at look that up for me? Um, who is the actor that was that played the guy that Benedict Cumberbatch fought? Who's the guy who's getting beaten up by a? a I can't, I can't even say because yeah, that's. A I'm gonna look. I, I, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name right now. I'll look it up. But anyway, who would you see as uh, as being a Wolverine? You know what? I mean, they've they've been throwing Tom Hardy's name around a lot. I wouldn't mind seeing him play Wolverine. It goes back to what we were just talking about with Tom Holland, uh, though, is I love Tom Hardy. He's one of my favorites. The, the problem is that Tom Hardy was 35, 36, whatever he is. Sure. If, if they're going long, the Atkins, long game. Atkins, by the way. It was a Atkins. That's, that's Atkins. what I was thinking, yeah. But they're going long game with him. Scott Atkins. I would go with somebody younger. I, and I'm saying someone I don't know. I don't want to pick a name of someone mm -hmm. I, know, I know because Wolverine, the character, is someone that if you get an actor with the chops, you bring in a 25-year-old, 26-year-old unknown actor with the chops, then you can have them play for a long time. The Wolverine can be a little older, obviously, but if you're gonna cast younger, I don't know what they're planning to do with this reboot. So I, I just think Tom Hardy, I wouldn't be sad about it, right. I'm a big Tom Hardy fan, I just think because of where he is right now, and plus but I'd rather like see Tom Hardy in Star too, Wars right Hugh now. Hugh Jackman, nobody knew who, yeah. who he yeah. was. He was and really- he was like 29 or yeah, something. So yeah, so I, I would almost go with that better than any, a name actor. Yeah, absolutely, if it's, if it's uh, if it works once, don't change it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. You know, I didn't, no one knew who Hugh Jackman was. And I mean, everyone was skeptical. I was like, who's that clown? And then you he's watch it. He's too tall. Yeah, right. yeah, he's too skinny. Yeah. He's not savage enough. He's not feral enough. And it totally worked out. So, I mean, I would rather that because I feel like even with Tom Hardy, although that's a good choice, if I see that actor in Wolverine's role, I'm just going to see the actor. Although now we see Hugh Jackman, but that's where it started. So it's okay. Have a Will Ferrell, Will Ferrell as Harry Carey as Wolverine. <laughs> Hi! Hi! Look, look at my clothes! Hi! Yeah. Hi! Look at my cuts, they're healing! Yeah, that would be Hi. amazing. All right, guys, hey, listen, it is Wednesday, which means it's time for us to talk a little bit about Rewind, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is the Feeling Old segment where we talk about the movies turning 10 years old this week and the films turning 20 years old this week. The films turning 10 years old. Stranger Than Fiction, speaking of oh, Will Ferrell. Hi. Oh, wow. <laughs> and also A Good Year. Turning 20 years old this week, we've got Set It Off. Whoa. And Ransom turns 20 this wow. week. Unbelievable. Jeremy, you look at those films that we just mentioned. Which one stands out to you? Uh, Ransom, for sure. I remember seeing Ransom in theaters. It was like, it was the most so intense did I. thing. And you're like, is that the new kids on the block guy? Is that Donnie <laughs> Wahlberg? Oh, my gosh. The guy is acting now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the Will Ferrell one, uh, The Stranger Than Fiction. I remember I watched that after theaters, and I enjoyed it. I really actually thought it was a sweet movie. But Ransom, I mean, I, when I found out that was Ron Howard, I'm like, wait, the guy from Happy Days? And then you're like, wait, Apollo 13 the same guy? And it just totally changed my perception on uh, Ron Howard uh, just subsequently so of his last two films so uh, in, in the other way 
But uh, yeah, Ransom. I loved that movie. I really did. I thought no, it was I, the most intense thing. I liked it too. I mean, obviously, Strange of the Fiction. It's the film that made a lot of people go, Will Ferrell should do some, try getting right. into drama a little bit after they saw it. But Ransom is the one that sticks out to me. Mm -hmm. It was intense. It was fun. I just can't believe it's 20 years yeah, old. Anyway, which one stands son. out to you? Give me back my son! <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that one. I mean, that's, that's the... And especially about 10 years later when you hear certain phone calls and you're like, oh, that's, that is, he's scary when he yells on the phone. Yeah. Um, but that movie, yeah, Ron Howard, Rene Russo, Mel Gibson, I remember reading that script. It was one of the first scripts I ever oh, read, wow. like 20 years or someone had given me that script. And I read that script and I was like, oh, I can't wait. It was the first time I ever read a script and to see it transfer on mm -hmm. the film. And it did. And I think Ron Howard did such a great job with it. Um, but yeah, Stranger Than Fiction is the other one that stands out because of that reason of seeing Will Ferrell do the dramatic role. And I would still like to see him do more of like, kind of doing what Jim Carrey did and mm -hmm. more of those type of things. And that's what we talked about Zach Galifianakis doing stuff like that too. So there is a lot of the sad clown doing some dramatic stuff. I, I just remember Stranger Than Fiction and not liking it because it was like they're trying to do that, you know, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, but it mm. was like fake. It <laughs> felt fake. It felt like, oh, and a, a weird, you know, carbon copy of what was really emotional and cool but like hey let's just remake it but shitty you know so <laughs> that's the one that sticks out to me set it off also was kind of a fun film ransom i just want to see a super cut of liam neeson having a special set of skills and then cutting back to Mel right Gibson. somebody should just edit that together oh my god that, that would be, be fun genius. that would be fun i have a particular set of skills <laughs> no. No. i will find you and i will kill you that give be, me back my son that would be amazing oh my god do it internet all right, let's get back to the Twitter questions. What is next? All right, Adam Nowalski writes, how do you decide, this is a Schmodown question, how do you decide what categories are on the wheel of destiny? They seem to come and go, for example, horror, Star Wars. Um, the wheel of death. The yeah. wheel of death. I call it the wheel of morality from Animania. <laughs> I know, it's true. Well, <laughs> the wheel of morality. Well, we have a writer, Chris Kalicki, who comes up with a lot of the questions, and then what we do is we, so... For example, if John Campy is going up against John Schnepp, we will take one of John's strengths and one of Schnepp's strengths, put them on there for sure, and then we kind of just go random around the, the entire wheel. Or figure out our weaknesses, and then we get those. We do and that. And then load them Oh, yeah, of yeah, 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 course. Well, you put those on there in case it goes up. Romance point of comedy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, what's next? Fame Dalla writes, who would you want to see play you guys in the Collider biopic? Oh, man. Oh, Liam Neeson, me. You? Yeah, probably Liam Neeson, I have me. Set of skills. <laughs> man, I, uh, you know, uh, about 15 years ago, I would have said Zach Braff when he yeah, was on yeah. Scrubs. Um, That's a brilliant do it now. pick, actually. Yeah. I totally see that. Oh, dude, my roommate when Scrubs was out, he was like, you have to see this show. This kid is you. I was like, is it? Oh, God. That's yeah. weird. <laughs> <laughs> it was really strange. I, it makes Seth Rogen gain a little more weight, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'll go Ruffalo. I like that Ruffalo character. <laughs> I like Ruffalo. That works. What about you, girl? Who, who would you girls want to see play you guys? Oh, um, I'm going to go with <laughs> She's on Ashley from go. The Bachelor. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. I'm going to go with... Who's the girl um, who plays Cece on New Girl? I get that all the time. Yes. I can't remember her name, but I was going to go with Mindy Kaling because she's absolutely hilarious and she's tan, so... <laughs> I'm going to go tan. with Lucy Liu. Lucy yeah. Liu is you? All right. Okay. What's Fantastic. next? All right. Uh, Nathan Kaiser writes, Fantastic Beast trailer wrote before Harry Potter in the trailer. Why doesn't Rogue One do that to avoid confusion? <laughs> That's very good question. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you know what? I, the, the more I'm talking to a lot of people now about that, and I actually think that they are almost past it. I think most people, the average moving going public at this point, gets it. This right. is this is the events that happens before Star Wars. Um, we were a little bit nervous in the early days, thinking, could this be confusing? Could it be confusing? And it could have been. But the way I'm gauging public perception right now is I think in mass, I think people are getting it. How are you picking this up? Listen, here's what's going to happen. Somebody, when you go to see this, this movie, somebody will tell somebody what's happening. So if you're taking yeah. someone who has no idea, you're gonna, there's enough Star Wars fans out there who are like, oh, so Ray's going to be, no, Ray's not going to be in this. Ray's not going to be in this. <laughs> Finn's not going to be in this. Is, you will see Darth Vader in this movie. I thought he was dead. It takes place, and it's going to have that whole yeah. conversation. That's going to happen on the line. That's going to happen in the theater. It's going to happen everywhere. Before the movie starts, whoever's going there to see it will know what's happening. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to say, I had that conversation with my dad. I showed him the trailer. He's like, so is this new? Does it take place after? I was like, no, it takes place, uh, you know, the opening scroll of A New Hope. It's that. It's the, it's the battle that they won, and they got the plans. This is them getting the plans. He's like, oh, cool. It was that and simple. And he got it. You know, yeah, it's yeah, that yeah. It's actually right in that text. I would like them to zoom 
name into the text, like not do a scroll, but that this is where the movie is. It's right here. This is what it's about. And Jar Jar better not be in it. I think you said it yesterday, though, too, that when we were talking about this, is that I think that Lucasfilm and Disney is being very uh, cautious and not using the word prequel. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, and it's, it's really, it's not... It's, it's really a funny thing because it's really not a prequel because it's not connecting any of the major characters in it. Like This isn't us seeing a young Princess Leia right. getting the, the Death Stars. At that point, I would call it a prequel because this is an entirely new set of characters. I actually wouldn't qualify it as a know. prequel. I think, I Showing think... Darth Vader in, is, just, is enough. That last trailer, you're like, Vader's in it. It's definitely not, has nothing to do with Force Awakens. Well, I, yeah, with Force Awakens, I would, I would definitely say that it is, it is a prequel because it ties in the events leading up to Episode Four. You doesn't necessarily have to have all the characters because Vader certainly is there. It's because the events that lead up to the beginning and what we know of Episode Four, I, I personally would consider it a prequel. I just don't think they should use the word. You, know, right. you know what it is. This is the reality. This is perception is reality. To half the Star Wars saga, it's a prequel. To the other half, it's a sequel. Who's right? That's right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> all right, what's next? Danny Hernandez writes, who would you say is Marvel's most complex villain? I say Magneto. Mm. Oh, I, beyond yeah. a shadow of a doubt, yeah, yeah. it's Magneto. There's a reason he is my all-time favorite comic book character. Not because he's good, not because he's bad, but because there is so much to him. Like, this is a dude, like we always say on this, on this show that the best and most compelling villains are the ones who think they're the good guys. Mm -hmm. And they're the most dangerous ones too. The ones who have moral conviction to what they're doing. They don't think they're being evil. They think they're doing what's right. Those are the most dangerous bad guys in film. And when you really look at Magneto, both in the comics and the way they translated that into a movie, you're talking about a guy who suffered extreme abuse and extreme loss and sees wrong things being perpetrated on his people. And in his mind, Humanity is the villain and he's trying to save his people. And that leads to some very gray areas with Magneto. And those are explored great. I talk about Age of Apocalypse all the time, but those are really explored well and how those manifest in Age of Apocalypse. Absolutely, Magneto to me, most, that's that's the best character. I don't know, Schnapp, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I agree Magneto's the best one, but a close second is Loki. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. he doesn't believe he's a villain, he's been wronged by yeah. Asgard. And so, I mean, yeah, the best villains are the ones who actually believe they're right. So that's that's Loki. But it's not just a villain. I think the question also is, is more like layered who's got the most to them. If, if we're going Marvel movies, then yeah, I agree with you guys. It's going to be Magneto. But if we're going MCU, I'm going to say Tony Stark. I think Tony Stark has a lot because if you look at where he was, what he, what he started, the, his vision, if you will, mm -hmm. The events that he went through, his entire world and perspective changed, yet he still is that kind of smug prick that we love. Mm -hmm. But And then you see he is cons always consistently evolving. Look what happened just in Civil War, the mm -hmm. things that he's going through. And there's, the guy keeps going through crap. Like it in the, I don't want to ruin Civil War, but there's something that happens at the very end of the movie. More stuff he's going to deal with now. There's yeah. always layers for him of what he's trying to go, th go through, go for, what he's fighting for. So I'd say in the MCU, it's Tony Stark, and I agree with the points on Magneto. Yeah, uh, the best villains not only the ones that uh, have that conviction of I'm the good guy, but the ones that make the audience empathize and go, I know why you're doing this. I mm. understand. And I can't say I'd be doing it differently had I lived your life. Um, all those guys embody that, but yeah, Magneto's the strongest one. I mean, his standalone comic books will just keep you just locked in. You're like, yep, go get him, Tiger. <laughs> it's like, you're just like right there like, I get it, totally. All right, what's next? The movie Night Writes. Getting into your line of work, what's the best place to start? Videos, podcasts, or blog? Um, as I'm always pointing yeah. out, there's a I, I put up a there's a two hour video I have online about getting started in YouTubing, blogging, uh, and podcasting. Just search on YouTube John Campia getting started, and, and you'll find that. Um, I honestly think today, from it, it all depends on you and your personality and what you like to do. I would, all that aside, I would normally recommend to most people try YouTube. Just try, just turn on the webcam on your thing, get a little mic and away you go. It's just that simple. Just get started, just start. Stop thinking about starting and just start. Oh yeah, I was gonna suggest, do it regularly. You're watching this right now, why? Because you know it's gonna be on every day. So if you're gonna do something on YouTube, make sure you do it every Monday at like eight o'clock and do it all the time. Be consistent. Be so, consistent. Yeah. yeah, reliability, consistency. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> do what do what your strengths are. You know, if, if you're like, eh, I don't like people seeing me on camera, maybe that gives you an anxiety, the, then just set up a microphone to do a podcast, yeah. you know, and just put a picture there. Or you can put pictures if you want. But yeah, it, it is you know you more than we know you. So play to your strengths. 
and that's just the key. Well, and go back. Don't just get on whatever it is, whether it's podcasting or writing or, or vlogging, whatever it is. Don't get on there going, oh, I need the subscribers right away. Get comfortable. Yeah, well, we forget always, that. Yeah, it's yeah. a long game. Yeah, it's a long game. What we always talk about, like Mark and I, is that when you're doing stand-up comedy, the first year is not about your jokes. It really isn't. It's about being comfortable on stage and owning the stage and learning that stage. It's no different whether it's podcasting or doing this. Get comfortable in front of the camera. Know that what you're doing and then pick one and just go. All right, what's next? Victoria P. writes, so what are your guys' favorite child actor performances? Mine is Jacob Tremblay in Room. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, oh. Haley Joel Osment in uh, Sixth, Sixth Sense. Sense. Yeah. An easy pick. Corey Feldman in Gremlins. Drew Barrymore in <laughs> E.T. The, I, I forget uh, the kid who was also in with Johnny Depp, ironically, in the Willy Wonka movie, oh, but they yeah, did yeah, Finding yeah. Neverland today. Mm. I think it's, yep. oh, yeah. what's that kid's Char name? Oh, in shoot. Finding Neverland, and uh, I'm sure everybody's going to throw that uh, throw it up in there. Right. Um, uh, uh, just, good I, actor kid. Yeah, that kid was great because he was also good, really, really good in Willy Wonka. But he was great in Finding Neverland, and I cannot remember the name of it. But I'm sure millions of you do. All right, let's take the next question. All right, Brenda says writes, "What do you folks think of Millie Brown, Millie Bobby Brown playing young Princess Leia?" I honestly I don't know who that is off the top of my head. She's from Stranger Things. Oh, she's eleven. Oh. Yeah, Millie too Bobby young. Brown, yeah. too young. Eleven. Too young. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know how old is 11, she. Yeah. No, she's like 12 or 13 right now. She's not 11. That's just her name. Yeah, because remember, this happens. Oh, this yeah, happens. Like, yeah. This will end steps up. the yeah, moment no, before no, no. Star Wars right. starts. You can't go from yeah. that yeah. age no, no, no. to Carrie Fisher. I'd like to see Billy Lord do it. I think Billy Lord, even Billy, though she was in yeah. Force Awakens, I mean, you could still play it up to where she could still do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, that kid was was, uh, was uh, Freddie Highmore. Thank you, Cody, oh, yeah. for saying that. All right, let's take another one. All right, A. Clay writes... How much effect does box office have on a film's Oscar chances? Very, very little, because we've yeah. like we've seen we've seen huge blockbuster, blockbuster movies get Best Picture nominations. A lot of times, a lot of the Best Picture nominations are the films you've never even heard of, right. because honestly, it, it doesn't have it doesn't have much. Um, I'm not going to say it has zero, but when you look at the history of the Oscars and, the, and movies get nominated, it becomes pretty clear. Big blockbusters get nominated. Films some people never heard of get nominated. I really don't think it's much influence. I think a little, not yeah. not much. I mean, you look at something like American Sniper, which I think it right. was, was the high, it was the most profitable movie of that year. I think that certainly it brought up more awareness because it brought up more conversation because of how many people had seen it. So I think in situations like that, it certainly does help a bit. But it's not like a bragging. Well, that movie made that much money, so we got to vote for it. I think it's more about the awareness and the conversation. Yeah, generally, I do know what the question. I, I feel like I know where they're going with it because most of of the time in the Oscars, the Oscar contenders are the smaller movies that a lot of people didn't go see and haven't heard about. So that is interesting. Um, but but that's to argue that well, do lower box office numbers mean Oscar nomination? Nah. Probably not. It's just it's just the the fact is the smaller movie just had more Oscar isms to it. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> the, the other thing too There's is like genre longer. pictures normally are not Oscar based. Right. So right. it's like. Star Wars or Raiders of the Lost Ark, people are like, yeah, millions of people love those films, popcorn films, but they're, they don't have that gravitas right. and that weight of an actor playing mm -hmm. a biopic. And those are the kinds of things that come out later in the year and they're like Oscar contenders and they're like true stories or they're based on real people. And those are the films that usually get kind of nominated because of the performances, because of the acting, because of the directing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that's kind of what happens in the Oscars and then one or two films from our genre pictures, mainly not science fiction, mainly not horror, but other kinds get nominated, obviously for special effects, for music, and then a couple sneak through once in, once in a while, like we got Heath Ledger posthumously for The Dark Knight. All right, guys, listen, uh, before we continue on with your Twitter questions, you know, a couple of you guys have already brought up this whole thing about the new Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. And where does this movie fit in with the overall thing? And more specifically, who is this Newt Scamander guy? That happens to be the topic and the focus of our brand new installment of our series, Crash Course. Who is Newt Scamander? Check this out. Who is Newt Scamander? J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World first materialized in June of 1997 with the publication of the very first book in the series, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Nearly 20 years later, we've seen six more books and eight installment film series, The Rise of the Website Pottermore, the very successful attraction, The Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal, and a London stage play. But the franchise isn't slowing down. 
Come November 18th, we're getting the Harry Potter spin-off movie Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. It's set 70 years before Harry attends Hogwarts and stars Eddie Redmayne as Mazagiologist Newt Scamander. Who is this Newt? Where did he come from? And what led him to the adventures we'll be seeing in Fantastic Beasts when it hits theaters? Grab your port keys, flute powder, and wands because we're going back to the beginning to introduce you to our new main man, Newt Scamander. Newton Optimus Fido Scamander, aka Newt, was born in 1897. From a very early age, the future magizoologist developed a fascination with magical creatures, partly because his own mother was a breeder of hippogriffs. Well done! From birth to his studies at school, Newt collected, examined, and dissected every magical creature he could get his hands on. In 1908, the call every young wizard dreams of came in. Newt was invited to attend Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please not Hufflepuff. Please not Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff! He was sorted into Hufflepuff and his magical education began, putting him into contact with loads of wondrous beasts. However, his fondness for these creatures ultimately led to a major mishap during which one of his teachers came into contact with one of his escape beasts. Not much is known about the teacher or the extent of his injuries. Nonetheless, the event did result in Newt being expelled from Hogwarts for the endangering of the school. It was Albus Dumbledore, his transfiguration teacher at the time, who argued against his expulsion. Clearly, Albus liked Newt, but alas, the future headmaster wasn't able to reverse the decision, and Newt left the grounds never to return to Hogwarts again. With nowhere to go, Newt took a job at the Ministry of Magic, spending two years in the office for house elf relocation, work he found tedious and boring. However, then he joined the Beast Division. <laughs> In 1918, Newt was commissioned by Augustus Worm of Obscurus Books to write the school textbook Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. At the time of this proposal, Newt was living from paycheck to paycheck, earning only two sickles a week. A sickle is a form of currency in the Harry Potter series. There are 17 sickles in a galleon and 29 nuts in a sickle, meaning there are 493 nuts to a galleon. <laughs> He jumped at the opportunity to earn some extra cash and also for the chance to spend his summers traveling the world searching for magical, dangerous, and curious creatures spanning a hundred countries across five continents. During his travels, Newt learned all about various creatures' abilities, often by trying to gain their trust. And if trust and magic didn't do the trick, there was always his traveling kettle, which doubled for making tea and for fending off unruly beasts. In December of 1926, Newt's research led him to New York City for what was supposed to be a brief stopover. There, a muggle named Jacob Kowalski accidentally opened Newt's magical suitcase, unleashing a number of critters and devilish fiends out into the cold streets of the city that never sleeps. And now, he's gotta catch him up! Sound familiar? This incident of major proportions is the source material for the upcoming movie adaptation Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. The events of the movie occur prior to the release of Newt's textbook, so you can expect a whole lot of curious creatures, magic, and adventure in this film series, which kicks off on November 18, 2016. Ashley Mova, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, right. well done. Yeah. Um, so hey, listen, that is of course a part of our Crash Course series. You want to check out all the various Crash Courses we've done, check them out on the playlist on our YouTube channel. With that out of the way, let's get back to our live Twitter questions. What's next? Ben Landers writes, with the new addition to the crew, is the dynamic still the same? Yeah, so this is one of the great things about, like when we first started talking about bringing Jeremy in, uh, and, and beyond Jeremy, also like Ken, one of the first questions we always ask, and this goes all the way back to the AMC days, one of the most important questions, Dennis and I would sit down and we would talk about, okay, we're talking about bringing on a new person, the big question, talent, yes, all that kind of stuff, how will they fit in with what we've got going on? And like Jeremy is like just the most natural fit oh. like ever with what we do oh. here. So that was no honestly the dynamic around here hasn't changed at all. Like, you should see it off camera. We're crazy. We're nuts. It I is know. it is a little <laughs> bit unruly. And so that's that's kind of sad. Have you guys noticed any difference? No. No, I mean I think that the thing is I work with Jeremy for like the last five, six years. I mean, two thousand eleven, I think. Mm -hmm. And then Ken, obviously, it's a long time. So the, the the characters definitely fit in. We're always looking for new characters. So there's gonna be a lot of fun as this thing grows. Yeah, the important thing for me was like whether or not I could have conversations bounce back and forth off camera. Because if you knew it off camera, you feel like you can do it on camera. And luckily I got along with everybody, so it worked for me. Okay, what's next? Gregory James writes, Your favorite woman empowerment film. Oh, Kill wow. Bill. 
Oh, Kill Bill is great. Right good. I right love good Kill job. Bill. God, like million dollar baby, even though it had a bummer in it. No, million actually million yeah. dollar baby was one of the <laughs> ones I was gonna say. I like that one is amazing. Yeah, it's really good. What do you think, Jeremy? Oh man. You know the, the one of the times I was like I felt gravity for me was a great one. Because all she had to do was get home. And that's it. And she did it. Yeah, that's a really big one. Yeah. Uh, we could probably I, I would say think Kill Bill, but <laughs> Yeah, Kill Bill's a great one too. All right, what's next? Oh, sorry, it's my turn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> George Abrams writes, what's your favorite unbroken shot in a film not counting Birdman? Touch of Evil. Uh, Children of Men. Oh, man. That, like, Children of Men. Also, also one that a lot of people forget about because the oh. movie's not very good. Snake Eyes. The Nicolas Cage oh, yeah, the movie. That opening, shot. That yeah, opening shot. Creed. Oh, the, the, oh, the, the fight. The fight. Oh, the, was a great his, his, the second fight in the film, it's just all one shot. It's amazing. I thought you were going to go good fellas, but I got to give a shout out to uh, Serenity. The movie Serenity, it starts out in the cockpit. He literally walks over to oh, the engine room. Oh, that's right. I totally forgot about it's that. A, it's a one shot until they leave the ship. Because yeah, they awesome. were like, look, son, we built this entire ship. Yeah, right. It's a whole it. set that they could walk through. It's, I would, it's I great. would also count the movie Rope, even though it is seven shots. It's seven continuous shots. Yeah. So each one of them is like 15 to 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Now, was, there was some Russian film that was done a couple years ago where the entire movie was one continuous shot. Mm-hmm. And they had like it took like so they had they put in months of rehearsal on it. It was kind of crazy. But yeah, that children of men one i think it's like six or seven minutes long check that out all right what's next justin writes what do you guys think about the divide between television actors and film actors is the gap between the two closing yes yeah it's definitely it's definitely closing like it used to be that when a guy who was at one point a great movie actor was kind of winding down their career you'd see them jump to tv and, and make a splash on tv but like a lot of movies now are a lot of tv shows i should say are shot cinematically now mm-hmm. Uh, in many ways and so you're getting that type of depth and preparation put into the TV shows that were normally you still can't put as much depth or as much prep into television as you can into movies because you'll take two years to make one 90 minute thing but it's getting closer and closer and closer and so now I think you're going to start to see that the actors are going to be far more interchangeable between the two types of mediums than ever before Um, listen if if you go back 20, 30 years ago, it was almost if you do TV, you are not a film actor. It's like yeah, the TV right. was yeah. like not respected. And mm-hmm. because of all the. It was so hard to jump into movies after that. And now with streaming and like every, it's it's so like theatrical and cinematic. The way it's like there are big. Like Julia Roberts is rumored to be wanting to do a film. Now, can you imagine Julia Roberts 20 years ago wanting to be a film actress? I mean, a TV actress doesn't happen. This is a lot. This is really bugging me. Yeah, it's sinking as I'm talking. So um, <laughs> anyway, so I think that, yeah, it is that absolutely. It's very different. There are there there are actors that are lining up to be in TV now. It's, it's not how it was years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the crossover, they were talking about the Dark Tower originally being a movie, then mm-hmm. a series, then a movie, like, and combine all those things. I think we could see that now a lot easier with, like, giant productions like Game of Thrones, the crossover of actors who are in that, then jumping over to movies, it's not even it's not even an issue. You're like, oh, I saw yeah. them on Game of Thrones. Now they're in that movie. Now they're on this TV series. So I think the line is clearly blended now. Yeah, and it's almost, dare I say, cool to be on a Netflix series. Yes. Like, oh, yeah. you're on a oh, Netflix yeah. series? That's so awesome. Yeah, but like, like you said before, I mean, you go back to the 90s and someone was in movies and they were in TV. Good job. You just shut the door. They locked it right. behind you. They welded it shut. There's no getting back. Mm-hmm. But now it's a different paradigm altogether. Like Hiddleston was in The Night Manager right. with Hugh Laurie. I don't think he's hurting at all. So, no, it's, uh, it definitely is a different world now than it was just a few years ago. All right, we're going to take two more questions. All right, Amin writes, hey guys, is there a required max and minimum length for a movie to be shown in theaters? Shown in theaters, no. To, because I mean, you can book a theater right. for whatever length of movie that you want to have. Length, uh, max and minimum length on films to be like Oscar eligible? Yes, there are min and max. I can't remember what those numbers like are. 85 minutes. Like if you see like if, if you see any movie that's on Hulu and it's like 45 minutes, it, you know. I'm not I, saying it's going to suck, but it's like it's just not a full film. I think 70 or 75 was the last time I checked that for it to cl- count as a, a feature. As a feature. Wow. I could be wrong, but I think it's as low as that. But th- those are there. All right. Last question of the day. Okay. We touched upon this yesterday, but Zach Wenzel writes, does Johnny Depp's tendency to overact worry you guys about his role as Grindelwald in Fantastic Beasts? Yep. Well, well here's the thing, though. Let, let's... <laughs> Remember, some some of these roles, like the Captain Jack Sparrow or Willy Wonka, 
Blanca. Those are roles that are requiring the actor to do mm -hmm. more flamboyant mm -hmm. overacting. And it's worked great. Like, even though the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, after the first, because I adore the first one, yeah. even though they've all kind of sucked since then, I've enjoyed watching Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow. That's the character. That's what he calls for. What I got kind of tired of was watching Johnny Depp continuously take those roles again and again and again and again and again. But when you go back and you switch gears and you look at some other things that he's done, like just like Black Mass recently, even though that movie didn't turn out as well as, as I think a lot of people, I still liked it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I thought Depp's performance was incredible. Yeah. I thought his performance in that was great. So it will all depend not on Johnny Depp overacting the role, it's all about what is the director gonna tell Depp that he wants out of that character. And if they reel that in a little bit, I think there's a very good possibility it could be quite good. Yeah, Johnny Depp's one of those guys you do, if, if the director has a vision, you need a director that works with Depp. You can't just have it go Ron Howard and Jim Carrey and the Grinch where Ron Howard's like, I just let him do whatever he wanted. And you got a really clownish Grinch. You need a director who's like, nope, that's not that's not him. You need to do this. And I, Johnny Depp is a good actor. He has it in him to do it. I hope it all works out, but I can't help but have that stigma in my head of uh, being concerned. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely, there's, there's reason to be concerned when he has been these over-the-top characters, but like you mentioned, he was great as the White Walker in Black Mass, uh, and in the <laughs> rum, rum, he was also in Rum Diaries, he, he was really good as Hunter S. Thompson in that but movie, But I hated too. that movie. The movie Fine, wasn't but, good, but, yeah. he, but he, 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 he was very well, yeah. But I think Jeremy's right in the fact that you have to, it, it's a matter of the director, it's Yates getting a hold of him and saying, listen, we need you to do this, this, and this, don't play it too over-the-top, because you look at what Kevin Smith did, and I didn't like him at all in Tusk. I thought that he was a character that was so cartoonish in Tusk with this really warped, just disturbing movie in general, and this cartoonish character. But then you put that same character in Yoga Hosers, and he was perfect. I mean, yeah. the, the, whatever you want to say about the movie itself, he was directed it's basically do the same thing that you're doing here but in this type of tone mm -hmm. so it's just a matter of using him the right way and I think Yates will be able to do that I agree 100% like Transcendence if, if he was pulled back a little bit and given a little bit more direction perhaps that movie wouldn't have sucked as bad but you know <clears throat> I think Tra Depp is a great actor so I'm excited to see him Tr try his hand in the Potter world and Yates is a great director so I think that combination is going to work alright guys that'll do it for this installment of Movie Talk thanks so much for joining us I want to thank the guys at the table with me starting over there still clearing his throat Mr. John Schnepp where can people find you people online like, drink some water Schnepp um, hey what's going on <laughs> Twitter, Instagram at John Schnepp and check out Heroes later today Right over here, Christian Harloff. Well, you can find me every Thursday on Collider Jedi Council or Christian Harloff Twitter and Instagram. Make sure you check out yesterday's Schmodown. It was Team Trek versus Team Superhero News. And on Friday... It was a great match. It was a great match. Friday, the debut of Mark Andreco and William Bibiani. Over here, we got Jeremy Johns. Jeremy, where can people find you in your purple tie? I know, yeah. You can find me uh, on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram at Jeremy Johns. D don't... I don't usually dress this nice, but I like to when I can for these guys. Yeah. Sitting over there, Mindy Kaling, where can people find you? <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Disney Movie. Happy Wednesday, guys. And of course, Wendy Lee, where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, simply at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to Comic Con HQ for mine and John Schnepp's show, Film HQ, new episodes every Saturday. Special thanks to all the guys behind the camera, and a special thanks to you guys for watching our show today. That'll do it for us. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.